think I'm out of time, unfortunately. So yeah. thank you. I yield back. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Chairman. Ambassador, good to see you again. Uh, why is it you take the toughest job there is at the, at the worst possible time and you arrive here seeming like, you know, I'm just getting started. I've got the energy. We're going to do this. Um, you, you're the only person I know that comes before a committee like this with a positive attitude and leaves with a positive attitude. And I want to commend you for that because the questions are inherently tough and mine will probably be no exception. It was touched on earlier. Uh, even though UNRWA wasn't our direct authority and certainly wasn't yours, Congress on a bipartisan basis now has essentially said we cannot trust the UN, specifically UNRWA, in Gaza. That means that by definition, many of the same people who worked for UNRWA will need to be rehired by some successor organization. Others will need to be recruited. With your vast experience both at the UN and now at USAID, how would we go about ensuring that, th that we vet people in a very different way, we vet programs in a different way, and at some time, God willing, in the near future, we be begin rebuilding Gaza for the, the Palestinians, the 1.2 plus million, who will hopefully be returning to what will become homes again. That's probably the largest job, perhaps since World War II, to look at an area so dense and have to rebuild. One, is your organization up to being a partner in that? And if not, who? I mean, this is a very challenging question. Let me just say, in the, in the here and now, um, there is no substitute for the humanitarian backbone that they provide. Just the sheer numbers of individuals, the experience they have, their knowledge of communities, again, where the trucks come from, who knows the routes, and just, and I'll get to your question, but one little parenthetical is Israel, about a month ago, uh, in light of the allegations, the horrific allegations, uh, ma made a decision that UNRWA could not participate in convoys uh, uh, to the north, humanitarian convoys. Um, but what that meant was fundamentally there could be no convoys to the north because you can't, as bombs are falling and kinetic operations are underway and terrorists are being pursued, you, you can't you know, suddenly invent an entire humanitarian infrastructure, which I know is not yeah. what you're suggesting. No, no Am Ambassador, yeah. just to narrow it for sake yeah. of time. Okay. After World War II, both in Europe and in Japan, we recognize that you come as you are and use what is available. That includes the people who know these routes, the people who uh, were teachers, the people who provided humanitarian aid. I don't have any illusion that suddenly we're going to find thousands of replacement people. My question really was, how do we vet, how do we participate in a vetting that can cause the people of Israel, the people of the United States as taxpayers, and, and Congress and yourself to have comfort that what happened, what has been discovered under the, the grounds of Gaza, uh, won't happen again. Uh, I have no illusions. Many of those people uh, may not love Israel, but they would, they do care about their people or foreigners who cared about people. So um, I'm not saying that, and maybe others here on the dais would say it, I'm not saying that, the, that you're disqualified if you work for UNRWA. I'm saying that at the top, there has to be new confidence. You, uh, you're too young, but I'm not to remember when the Red Cross had no confidence and we brought in Elizabeth Dole. She didn't fire everybody, but she did begin rebuilding confidence in that great organization. How do we re rebuild the confidence to take care of the worst humanitarian disaster in modern times? Um, well, despite whatever energy I might have, positive energy, I hope, uh, fundamentally, this is not something that I have dug into personally, but 
the second. You're just one phone call away from the president giving you this job. You know that. <laughs> uh, but the second investigation underway, there's one into the named individuals that the Israelis brought forward uh, who are alleged to have been complicit in or particip actively participated in October 7. The other investigation is on this question, on the policies and the procedures and the vetting. And that's for UNRWA itself. But I would presume that whatever lessons are gleaned about UNRWA would be the ones that would be applied as well to other organizations who, of course, the organizational leadership are all worried uh, you know, uh, that, that you know, allegations like that could be brought forward. But their, their presence, again, in Gaza is so small that their ability to take, which I know, again, is not what you're suggesting, but to take up what UNRWA has been doing in wartime uh, is not present. I will say also, last point, is that other donors are going to make a huge difference here. We are following the law, the Biden administration. Uh, you know, we think it's really important to con for UNRWA to continue to do uh, its vital work, particularly in places like Jordan and elsewhere in the region, but also in Gaza where the needs are so great. Um, but that we are going to follow the law, and, th and that is not going to be possible for the U.S. to fund. Other countries are stepping up and doing more to sustain UNRWA. Um, and, you know, I think we want to make sure that they are also using their leverage on behalf of UNRWA reform if UNRWA ends up, uh, you know, being the organization of choice for the rest of the world uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, for being here. I want to thank you for the work you do. Uh, 